special treat. Good morning, Jerry Road. Ah, we're delighted to see you today. We're glad to have you home. We're glad to have Miss Katrina home. And uh, so we're, we're excited about you being well and back with us. So praise God for that. Pastor Ronnie will be home Wednesday afternoon or Wednesday night. And so we'll be excited to have him home and yeah, we'll be in good shape. So Praise the Lord. I, I, I'm, I'm just excited to be here this morning. I'm excited that you're with us. Grateful for our choir and our musicians and uh, looking forward to praising God with you. Uh, if you would like to sing in the choir, practice on Tuesday mornings at 10. Love to have you be a part of that. Men's prayer group at 11 o'clock on Tuesdays. Uh, brown bag Bible study uh, at 12.15 on Tuesdays. And we're having a super time in the book of James there. Uh, the Midweek Encourager is posted online about lunchtime on Wednesdays. I hope that's being a blessing to you. Um, next Sunday, um, I'm preaching a message I know you've just been waiting on. And how to complain to God the right way. <laughs> All right? <laughs> There's a right way and a wrong way. We're going to talk about that next Sunday. Also, at the end of the service next Sunday, not today, but next Sunday, the 19th, we'll be, uh, we'll be having a short business meeting uh, about, uh, about our, our new church plant. All right? So you want to be here for that. And uh, again, continue to watch for the... Uh, uh, updates on our on our uh, homecoming uh, it's been postponed for now hopefully God will let us uh, pull that back together and do it a little bit later let's pray together and then we'll sing Lord Jesus we love you thank you for the privilege of being in your house thank you for the privilege of worshiping you freely and openly here in America God, let us never, never, never take that freedom for granted. Lord, would you, uh, would you this morning focus our minds on Jesus. Focus our minds on your word. Lord, uh, let's, let's leave all the problems and all of the world outside right now and just focus on worshiping Jesus. And we will thank you 
Thank you. Thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Miss Katrina. Hello. Good morning. It's so good to be back with you all. Um, we're going to start off today by singing My Country Tis of Thee. Um, you'll notice it'll be tied to what Brother, Brother Tommy is going to be preaching on today. Um, so if you want to stand with me, we'll start with My Country Tis of Thee.
So this song, for me, it, I mean, the chorus, I must tell Jesus. I had to. So sing with me, sing with me today, um, um, I must tell Jesus.
thank you so much, Miss Joyce. Wonderful. All right. Um, if you will, if you're physically able to stand, uh, would you stand with me while we read from God's Word? All right. Reading out of Joshua chapter 4. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of Israelites, to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan River was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When the Ark crossed the, the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So the Israelites did as Joshua commanded them. Joshua set up the 12 stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan River at the spot where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood. And they are there to this day. Thank you. Have a seat, please. You know, as we... Yesterday, we, we had opportunity to celebrate the 20th anniversary of 9-11. On that day, it seemed like the world stopped when the eyes and hearts of every American watched the horrific events that were unfolding on the TV screens. The events were shocking. Uh, we'd never seen anything like that in America. i uh, never experienced anything like that. Terror uh, struck our nation in a devastating manner. A total of 2,996 people died in, in the attacks as a result of the attacks that day. While more than 6,000 other people were injured as a result of the attacks. The deadliest terrorist attack in the history of the world. It was the most devastating attack on American soil since the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. We're coming up on 80 years on that one this December. On that Tuesday morning, I remember we, we were in our staff meeting at church and one of the secretaries came to the door and knocked on the door of the conference room and said, guys, y'all need, need to come out just for a minute and see what's happening in New York. And the secretaries had wheeled a, a, a TV into the, uh, into the hallway there and had had the, the news on. Of course, that was the only thing on that day. And we stood there just with our, our chins on our chest as we watched the, the results of that first attack. And then we, as we were standing there, the second plane hit. And, and then later the first tower fell and then the second tower. And, you know, we, we were just, the, the, the fear was tangible. You could touch it. And the, just the, the uncertainty of the, the, the shocking events, you recall. You probably remember exactly where you were, exactly what you were doing when you stopped to watch. But have we forgotten 9-11? We promised as a nation we'll never forget. But I'm afraid we have for, for in, in, in many instances. One of the things I remember about that day and, and that the, the coming days was how our nation unified and absolutely resolved that we will never forget this tragic day in American history. 
President Bush gave courageous leadership, courageous leadership through that. And with his leadership, our nation, our government, both parties, all three branches of our government united together and resolved to bring an end to terrorism around the world, starting right here in the United States. And it wasn't a partisan decision. Everybody jumped on it and said, let's get it stopped. Let's get this done. And, you know, nothing has ever been the same in our nation since 9-11. The way we travel, the way we shop, the way we live in fear. It's never been the same because of, because of those attacks. And, you know, look, as, as, as we look back over these past 20 years, there's not been anything, any other, any other uh, event that has caused our nation to be more moved, more resolved, or more unified than 9-11 of 2001. And so, in some ways, America will never forget, especially those of us who were alive and lived through it, experienced it. You know, of course, I realized that we didn't experience it firsthand, but we watched it live on TV. And we watched it over and over and over again. And I remember, I remember just the, the 20th time through watching that same film clip, it was still just as unbelievable as the first time we saw it. But you know, sadly, some Americans, and particularly younger Americans, have forgotten what this meant to us. And many of our younger generation have created an image in their minds. Some of them have imagined an image in their mind that it really wasn't that bad because that's the way their worldview works. And they've got to justify this with their worldview, which is false, right? And we've got to remember, we've got to teach our kids, we've got to teach our grandkids, we've got to teach our great-grandkids the horrors of past lessons. Because as somebody way smarter than me said, those who don't remember the past are doomed to repeat the past. And the only way to, the only way to prevent repeating the past is to change the future where we're not in the same position as we were in the past. And so the heroes of 9-11, the first responders, the thousands and thousands of common, ordinary people just like you, you and me who were not first responders on that day in those three locations became first responders, and many of them lost their lives trying to save the lives of other people. I believe we probably would have done the same thing had we had an attack here in Memphis. I think that, I, I think we would have jumped in just like they did. Because as Christians, we're designed to help. We're designed to meet hurts. We're designed to meet needs. And I'm grateful for that. 
But you know, as the years passed and the memory dims, the emotions tend to go down as well. To the point that sometimes we, too, forget. So what do we need to remember on this 20th anniversary of 9-11? We need to remember that evil exists around the world, and it exists right here in America. Still exists. Evil still exists. That's part of living in a lost, sinful, dying world. Satan, at this point, is the god of this world. And his job, his job is to scare us into being scared. As I pointed out on last, last Wednesday's broadcast, Satan's not going to heaven. He knows he's not going to heaven. And he wants us to be afraid of going to heaven. And for some of us, he's done that. He scared us into not living because we're afraid of dying. He scared us into not living because we're afraid of dying. That doesn't fit, that doesn't dovetail with John 10.10, 10, where Jesus said, I've come that you can have life and life more abundantly. And I believe God wants us to live a joyful, abundant life. And when we live in fear, whether it's uh, another attack, whether it's covid or whatever else it might be, when we live in fear, we can't live abundantly. When we live in fear, we're going directly against God's word. Total, absolute disobedience to what God has done, told us, because he's told us over and over and over and over, do not fear, do not be afraid. And he's given us the Holy Spirit to allow us to live in that way. We need to be on alert. We always need to be alert of danger that's around us. Let me show you something. Got here in my pocket. You're probably not going to be able to see what this is. But Miss Lydia picked this up right out here in our in our parking lot this morning. This is a nine millimeter slug. Evil's all around us. Evil's right here in our neighborhood. Evil's right here on our church ground. But you know, we can't live in fear. Jesus said, I've come that you can have life and life abundantly. That doesn't mean be stupid. <laughs> right? My grandkids sometimes look at me and say, oh, Grandy, that's an ugly word. That's why I said it stupidly. <laughs> we, can't, we can't live ignoring the evil. But we can live trusting God. And we trust when we trust him, he gives us that abundant life. I read a report last night on one of the, the websites that I follow. There is a huge revival going on in California. There's one church in California who's baptized over 3,000 people over this past summer. Because Christians have begun to stand up to the government, the most liberal state in our nation, and the Christians have begun to stand up and say, that's enough. We're tired of it. 
we will still meet and worship our God. We will obey God rather than men. And people are flocking to the gospel because Christians are standing up. And they're not hunkering in their homes saying, I'm scared. I don't want to get involved. That's why we're in the mess we're in. Is because we have not gotten involved. Christians are standing up. Day after tomorrow, Tuesday, there is a boat, a statewide boat in California to recall the governor, the liberal governor who has shut down the churches. He's made all kinds of unlawful, illegal stuff against Christians over this pandemic. And the Christians have banded together and said, no more! And they have forced a vote to recall this governor. Now the left says it will not happen. Not here. But the Christians are running a candidate that the left is deathly afraid of. And stands, he stands a tremendous probability of winning the governorship in that state. Folks, if it can happen in California, it can happen in Tennessee. Amen. But it takes us being involved. We can't just sit here and say, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do it. I don't want to help those people. Those people. Enjoy life like you're living. Because it will never change until we as Christians stand up and get involved. It's working in California. Of all the places in America, it's working there. May God grant us the ability to quit chickening out and sitting on our blessed assurance. We need, to, we need to remember that we need God and we need each other. On 9-11, days following, there was nobody cussing God. There was nobody cussing religious freedom, religious liberty. People banded together and said, we need God. We need each other. Scripture tells us two are good but three are better because if one stumbles, the other two can help them up. We need each other. We need God because we need to stand up and tell our government, that's enough. That's enough. We've been the doormat for too long and it's time to stand back up and say, Jesus is the door, not the doormat. And that's not going to happen unless you and I stand up and do something. We remember that in 2001, we had a massive surge in church attendance for a few months. But once again, we as Christians, we as church attenders just went on with church as usual and we failed to draw these new people in to make them a part of our body. Oh, you can come and sit by us, sure. You're welcome to come and, 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 and occupy a seat. Just not my seat. Just not my seat. Don't ask me to come over and sit beside you because this is my seat. If you want to come sit by me, that, that might be okay. But I, by, by dingy, I am not moving. 
I will not be moved. And as a result, we failed as the church. Big, big picture. The church. We failed to reach people when they were hurting, when they had needs, and they needed to be together with Christians. And we failed. That's why our church attendance is smaller now than it was before 2011. Not just our church, but the church as a whole. We can remember, I think everybody in here can remember, when our government, sure, the Republicans have always had an agenda. The Democrats have always had an agenda. But it's, it wasn't that terribly many years ago that our government agencies, our government divisions would come together and make decisions for America not just for the Republicans, not just for the Democrats. And we work together for the good of our nation instead of the good of our party. And it's time for us to stand up and say, we've got to have that kind of leadership again. Our president, is complaining to the Taliban government in Afghanistan. And his major complaint is, y'all have no women involved in government. <laughs> they don't even believe in women. They don't even believe in women. And yet, he is more concerned about no women in the government than he is about the six airliners full of American people and American contractors that the Taliban is holding captive on the tarmac. America needs courageous leaders. America needs courageous leaders and we ain't got them. That's terrible English, but it's great theology. All right. We need leaders who will consider others more important than themselves. We need leaders who will seek the good of our nation above their party and their agenda. Do you not recall as you read your Bible how God told the Israelites, you're to have no other God before me. You're to serve me. You're to do exactly what I tell you to do to prove that you love me. And if you don't, I will discipline you. That applies to you and me today. We have so many other gods in our lives that we've displaced our Heavenly Father with our favorite things. Why do we think it's strange then that America is in the mess we're in? It's like the old black pastor used to tell his church. We need to pray for God to change the status quo. That's Latin for the mess we're in. And God is the only one who can change this. But it's going to take God's people standing up and being involved. We need to realize... <clears throat> We need to remember the value of our first responders 
and the members of our military as we face uncertain days inside our nation and around our world. Where would we be without our military? We've got to depend on God to draw our nation back to himself. The, this 20th anniversary ought to be a call to us as a church. Because we're Christians. We're the church. We believe in prayer, right? We've got to believe that prayer, prayer is our, our greatest weapon. Prayer is our greatest weapon. Prayer brings down walls. Prayer crosses over all of the barriers. Ethnicity, race, generation barriers, and prayer can bring down these walls that are separating us and dividing us from each other. Because these walls are lies straight out of the pit of hell. But we have sat back and said, there's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can do. Yes, there is. But it takes getting up and doing something. The, our sinful nature, our sinful choices is what has allowed these walls to be erected. Because we've sat back and said, I don't want to hurt people's feelings. What about our feelings as Christians? Well, you know, I just, <clears throat> I just forget, forget. Not real sure about that one. I just live and let live. I don't think you can back it up with scripture. Live and let live puts us where we are today. Because we as Christians have been quiet. It's time to make some noise. It's time to get up, get involved, and get going. And get our America back for the glory of God. Our sinful nature has allowed the, has allowed to, the, the barriers, the walls to be built. But Jesus' work on the cross can bring them down. Jesus' work on the cross can bring them down. The cross was a historical marker, just like the, just like the pile of rocks that Joshua stacked up there on the, on the Jordan River. On this, on this 20th anniversary, God's calling us back to himself. He's calling us to get back to living like believers. Living like people who believe this book. Living like people who believe in prayer. Living like people who believe in an abundant life for the glory of God. Living like people who believe that washed people are really going to hell when they die. God is calling us back to himself. He's saying, come back to me. God has, used, God has used the COVID pandemic as a national, worldwide even, call, altar call. Come back to God. Come back to God. Come back to God. Now, Satan tried to shut down all the churches. But as a result, Many, many, many churches, including ours, began TV ministries, internet ministries. And all of a sudden, we couldn't meet inside this building, but for those weeks, every home was a church because the gospel was available to anybody who turned it on. What if we had said, we don't want to get involved in that? What if we offend people sending the gospel into their home? What if we don't? What if people hear the 
gospel in their home and trust Christ. And we don't know anything about it until we get, get to heaven. And they give glory to God at the judgment seat of Christ. And they say, it's because Cherry Road Baptist Church was proactive, got involved, and put the gospel on my television. What's the difference, folks? What's the difference? We, God is calling us back to himself. We need to repent of our unbelief. We need to repent of our inactivity, of our uninvolvement. Get right with God and get right with each other. This 20th anniversary ought to be a historical marker. Ought to be a historical marker for us. When the unchurched come into our building, when the lost people come into our building, when those who have been away from God and come back to our building, they should see us involved, committed to an abundant life. They should see us involved, committed to prayer. They should see us involved, committed to evangelism. See us committed to, involved in reaching our community, changing our community for the glory of God. But it means we've got to get involved. We've got to do something different. My prayer is that today, this 20th anniversary weekend, You and I will answer this call to repent. Get right with God. Get right with, with, with each other. Get right with our community. And we'll either drive a stake in the ground or we'll pile up some rocks or stack up some bricks. And when our families come to our homes, we'll be able to say, that represents my commitment to do something different. That represents my commitment to get right with God and reach people for Christ. And it started on the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Let's make a monument. Let's make a decision. Let's get involved for the glory of God. Jesus alone is the answer. Always has been, always will be. He is the only one who can change this. We're, we're going to sing an invitation to him. Take my life, lead me, Lord. And one of the first things he's going to lead us to do is to repent and return to Christ as the only answer. Ms. Katrina, come lead us. Let's stand and sing this prayer to God.
make my life useful to thee, and then we say it again. It's a very simple, um, but let's try to sing really loud, because I don't have um, amplification, I think, at this moment. But you know what? This room has amazing <coughs> acoustics. Amazing acoustics. So let's just sing out to our God, okay? Take my life, lead me, Lord. apart from you. <clears throat> Help us to love you enough to get involved. Help us to love our family enough to get involved so that we can give to our grandkids and our great-grandkids an America that we and be proud of as well. God, change our hearts. Change our nation for your glory and your glory alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I love you. Thanks for coming this morning.